cents today. Let's see, it's 50. You are watching something remarkable going on at the end of a school day in an experimental learning program. These children are being paid in cash for their work in class. Leslie's in school too, being taught to alter the flow of blood to different parts of her body. A function once thought completely beyond our conscious control. They are taking part in behavior modification. Some find the programs frightening. Others are convinced they will give man new control over his own destiny. And it all started with a pigeon in a box. In this age of increasing unrest and chaos, we are struggling to understand why we behave as we do before it is too late. Behaviorists are trying to find out how the design and structure of our environment shape the way we act. Director of the Institute for Behavioral Research in Silver Spring, Maryland, Harold Cohen. Man is the, uh, one of the major animals, in fact, the only animal who can, in fact, reshape his environment. All the other animals are gathered together, they make nests and they do a variety of things, but man is the principal organism who in fact has had an impact upon his environment. And the question has always been, what effect does that have on, on man himself? Man shapes the environment and it in turn reshapes him. So there's been no question as to whether or not man is being directed by the outside in terms of his behavior because we have a lot of religious dictum of thou shalt not kill, etc. So that man has been directed by the rules that he himself has created. We create our own surroundings and the feedback they give us shapes and molds our behavior somewhat like a chemical reaction. By altering these environmental factors, some scientists suggest we can affect massive changes in our behavior groundwork for the idea that man's behavior is shaped by his environment was worked out in a lab like this one with a confused bird and a device known as a Skinner box. Psychologist B.F. Skinner in the early 30s found he was able to mold a pigeon's behavior, get it to do very unbird-like things by providing a controlled environment that rewarded and encouraged the behavior he sought. Skinner started with simple pecking behavior. When the disc is pecked, the dispenser is activated and the pigeon is given food. Once he discovers that pecking behavior results in a free lunch, there's no stopping him. The box can be rigged so that a specific number of pecks are required for a pigeon snack. Eight, 10, 16, and the bird will perform accordingly. Using food pellet rewards called reinforcers, Skinner soon had his pigeons dancing figure eights, even playing ping pong. And the public was amused. But the laughter stopped when he and his followers posed the inevitable question. If a pigeon's behavior can be systematically shaped and modified by a system of environmental reinforcers, what about man? The concept of working reinforcement has been very powerful in working directly with humans in such areas as the fact that if you're ill and you want to control some of the functions, there was an old point of view that man did not control his autonomic functions. And yet people in the, in the Orient were controlling their many functions we thought was some sort of magical device. Today, for example, in our own laboratory, we have human beings through a schedule of reinforcement, giving them feedback, can actually control their own blood flow. Leslie is sitting in what you might call a giant Skinner box in the laboratory of Dr. Edward Taub, automated to reward her for self-increasing or decreasing the flow of blood to a particular part of her body. Who doesn't know how she does it, manages to alter the flow of blood to her hand. 
the resulting rise and fall in skin temperature activates banks of feedback lights. When an entire bank lights up, a change of one degree has been achieved and there's a cash payoff of 25 cents for every quarter degree change. Almost anyone can be trained to do it, and the best, like Leslie, routinely display skin temperature changes of up to 15 degrees in one 15-minute session. This work may soon be tested in the Arctic. Men will be taught to self-regulate an increase in blood flow to their hands in the hope of giving them better dexterity and a new weapon against frostbite at temperatures far below zero. Work being done with these monkeys may also someday have vital applications for people who have suffered spinal cord damage or loss of a limb. These animals have had one or more of their forelimbs deafferented. That is, their spinal nerve roots have been cut and all sensation, sensory feedback, and spinal reflex action have been eliminated. It was once thought that such damage meant the end of all meaningful movement in the affected limbs. It's being shown otherwise at the Behavioral Biology Center. Dr. Edward Taub. With adequate training, the afferented animals were capable of carrying out virtually every major category of movement. This is a unilaterally deafferented animal. The right hand is deafferented, the right arm, and the left arm is normal. Originally, the animal was unable to use the deafferented arm entirely. Even though he uses the deafferented limb, however, he still has a marked preference, as you can see, for the intact normal limb. And left to himself, he would pick up raisins exclusively with the intact limb. However, through shaping procedures, what are called shaping procedures, um, we're able to get him to use the uh, deafferented limb even for this relatively difficult task. When the animal is very hungry, uh, we can increase his motivation sufficiently to try and force him to use the deafferented limb. Very shortly, he gets the idea and begins using the deafferented limb predominantly and eventually will use that limb exclusively for picking up the raisins. The purpose of the rewards is to keep her working. We want to reinforce her and uh, as an intermediate step along the way of achieving the performance that we're interested in. The next step involves more complex grasping behavior, picking raisins out of shallow boxes, forcing thumb and forefinger coordination. Will the reinforcing raisin be powerful enough to shape grasping behavior in a limb without feeling? Again, you see that he will prefer to use his deafferented hand, uh, his intact hand, and only when the experimenter manipulates the contingencies of reinforcement so that he can only get the food by use of his deafferented hand will he do so. Once he begins using his deafferented hand, however, you can see that he is able to get the raisins between, pick them up from the shallow well between his thumb and forefinger. Given the fact that the animal has no sensation whatsoever in the hand, or in the limb, and no spinal reflexes, uh, this is certainly 
manual dexterity far beyond what was classically considered to be possible in the absence of sensory feedback delilah is just now learning complex grasping behavior notice how at first any grasping motion even if unsuccessful is rewarded she'll soon be doing as well as her friends the possibilities are exciting and may lead to rehabilitation centers for people with artificial limbs there may be new hope for all types of injuries using reinforcement techniques many applications are possible if we can cope with the real danger posed by misuse of behavior modification, the threat of mind control. Our concern, many of our colleagues are as well, as to the use and the misuse of the technology. Every technology uh, can go either way. I remember when I first studied design at the Institute of Design, I was taught by Bauhaus designers and architects it was explained that the tool that was developed was such a beautiful tool. If you developed a knife, and that could be used for surgery or for slaughter, for murder. And that the tool has, in a sense, no moral responsibility. It's always the human being that makes the decision. Now, the concept of control, and how much, and who is the controller, is one that has plagued man since the beginning of government structure. Uh, we're plagued by it right now, and we'll always be plagued by it. The question is, how much control and how much authority do you give the government, even our government, the people's government, and how much control do you allow for the society, the individual, the group? It is massive application that frightens most of us, especially when it involves children like Scott, who's in a part-time tutorial program. It is only used here with the permission of the individual. That's one of the important safeguards. Nothing is to be done without particularly explaining things fully, directly, and permission. Scott spends a few hours of each school day here at the Diagnostic and Learning Center, building up behavior that should give him tools for success. And we work with parents and with teachers. And someone says, well, what right do you have to do that? And I said, the right was on the request of the citizens. And that with all the kind of protection that that must entail. So we have, for example, a committee, our own committee, to the protection of human subjects. We then work with the schools. The schools have their own principal. They have the Parent Teachers Association. We have the county. We have the Board of, the board of Education. All people then are knowledgeable and protect the subject. And that's essential. Well, it's different from regular school. You know, you get paid for points, and it, it gives you something to work for. And you get paid a certain amount per point. That's what helped me, you know, to get stuff that I like my stereo and camera. The point system, or token economy, is a crucial element for the educational programs set up with local public schools. Points are earned for study units in English and math skills and good behavior. They can be traded in for money and leisure time breaks outside of school or in the lounge. The token economy gives children a tangible reinforcer, one they can save and exchange for a good time. It uses the purchasing power of the allowance. The money comes from the children's parents. They are encouraged not to give home allowances so that the point system will work effectively. A fixed allowance handed out every week need not affect behavior but it can become a powerful tool for shaping up learning skills when it is used as a reinforcer for educational work done. Parents can initiate other similar token economies at home. We are all conditioned to punishments and rewards. If we go to work, we get paid. 
But the controversy begins when money is used in a school environment as a reward for good behavior. Cohen asserts that money is only used when needed to prime the pump until the student is doing well enough to discover a new and more meaningful reward. One of the things that maintains all our behaviors is, is success. So we start with something which then, in a sense, reinforces the individual by doing the task. And then after a while, he learns to be appropriate. He learns to get 100%. He's getting A's. He gets turned on. Encouragement and love are powerful reinforcers. If there is no bad, what about inappropriate behavior? Discipline. Program director, Joan Cohen. The research in the area of behavioral analysis has shown that these verbal reprimands are in fact very reinforcing. And instead of extinguishing or stopping the behavior, tend to perpetuate it. The data indicate that youngsters displaying inappropriate behavior get a much higher proportion of teacher attention than those youngsters who are be, uh, exhibiting the appropriate behavior, that on-task uh, behavior that the teacher has as her target. It makes us take a second look at what we call punishment and a very careful look at what it is we're reinforcing or trying to develop in terms of in-class behavior. Uh, as a result, the, the model for behavior modification is to ignore through, is to extinguish through ignoring the inappropriate behavior, to define or model the appropriate behavior, and wherever possible, reinforce that behavior with feedback. Yes, that's a good job. Look, Johnny's doing his work at his desk. This teaching machine can't offer verbal reinforcement, but it has its own special way of rewarding good work. You don't wait two weeks for a teacher to mark a test paper here. Press a button, and the machine tells you if you're right or wrong instantly. An incorrect? Try again. A correct answer, and you may be on your way to the lounge for a break. Some students are progressing at four times their normal learning speed. The growth rate of 80% of the children has doubled. But is this at the expense of individuality? Is the systematic use of reinforcement principles shaping everyone in the same mold? Will we become a society of conformists? The answer is no, absolutely not. What we're trying to do is to teach the individuals uh, expand their understanding of society so they can read it. Secondly, is to give them a whole vast range of repertoires so they can participate in it, so they have the proper language and communication skills, and so that they can say, I don't really care for this, and I think there should be another alternative. After school, Scott does chores around the house. Today, it's sawing down a small tree for firewood. Here is the key to responsible use of child management. The children understand the relationship between reinforcement and behavior, and use it to their own benefit. Many put themselves on token economy programs at home, getting points and privileges for helping out around the house. The democratic institution is run on a slot machine principle. It's like, you know, you hold up the golden light, you, you can come, you're poor, but you can work and make it, make it big. These opportunities for very large payoff after long periods of time, as well as small intermittent scheduled payoffs, is what keeps an individual moving, and therefore reinforcement is a very complicated phenomenon. And it's not very simplistically just giving somebody an M&M &M or saying good each time. That's a misunderstanding the use of the whole principle. The principle is a life principle. The reason we're all alive and have not sliced our throats is because we believe, no matter how bad it is, that it's going to get better. That there's something reinforcing in staying alive. Victor Frankl, for example, in the concentration camp, some people put themselves against the electric wires. Others stayed alive and he wanted to know why. 
is because they believe that somehow there is some reinforcements coming. There's something to work for. And it doesn't have to be immediate. A Jesuit will wait until death for life. The powerful effect of reinforcement can be used to improve the quality of our lives, say the behaviorists. A whole populations may decide on behavior patterns for themselves, and then go about redesigning and restructuring their environments to support their objectives. The behaviorists are very much aware of the danger of misuse. Skinner himself has said, there is nothing in behavior modification that guarantees it will be used by good people. It is up to all of us to make sure this powerful tool doesn't fall into wrong hands, to see that it is used only to bring about desirable changes in a democratic society.